Uh, hey, Mike here from MikeStinger.com, and thanks for watching Social Talk, which is all about interviewing somebody cool in the social media industry each week. This week we have none other than my good friend Jeff Kreider, who is the uh, marketing director at Lebanon Ford, and all in all, he's a, it, well, I guess in my opinion, cool. social media rock star. Uh, of course, he doesn't call himself a rock star, but I think he is. So anyways, how's it going, Jeff? Pretty good. It's, uh... I've been told many things, but cool has not been one of them, so I appreciate the compliment. Uh, that, that's, that's a lie. I'm sure you've been called <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to have you on kind of as the first installment of, of the new Social Talk. And like me and you, we've had lunch together a number of times, which we need to have lunch uh, again sometime soon. And and you, I always like your insight and your, your kind of your thoughts and ideas with social media because like when, when I go to talk to you, I... Uh, I, 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 you know, of course, since I work in social media, I feel like, oh, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good with the stuff and whatnot. But when I talk to you, I feel like, damn, I really need to step my game up. So, uh, I'm, I'm really glad to uh, chat with you. And so, uh, for everyone who doesn't uh, know who you are, uh, let, every, let everyone know who you are and uh, what you do. Yeah, well, um, obviously, you know my name, Jeff Prater, but uh, I am the marketing director at Eleven and Four, which is a uh, Sort of a smaller four dealership out of Lebanon, Ohio, right down the street actually from Mike. Um, and really, my job or what I'm, my purpose is I'm, just, I'm trying to change the status quo when it comes to automotive retail. I'm trying to find alternative ways of making the automotive retail experience um, something to share, something to talk about, something remarkable. Um, so, a lot of things that I'm coming from, a lot of the places that I pull my ideas from, really stem from taking a look at the automotive retail space and the uh, retail space in general and how can we create a remarkable experience uh, at our dealership and uh, as a result of some of those efforts um, I've definitely kind of uh, spawned a lot of uh, thoughts when it comes to social and marketing and, and, and how tying those things together um, but coming from Starting off, or starting off as the Facebook coordinator at the dealership, and ultimately becoming the marketing director, uh, it became pretty clear that Facebook. This is back in 2010. Uh, that Facebook wasn't the answer, but it was a, a larger, um, integrated type of piece. And then ultimately, like what we know now, after the kind of the novelty wears off, that it's just a uh, a channel, and it's just a a tool in the toolbox. So you can use whatever analogy you want, but at the end of the day, it's just a, another avenue to, to tell your story and to market. Awesome and and yeah, we we've talked quite a bit about uh, how how well social media has done for for Lebanon Ford itself and and I mean you shared some stats with me and I don't know if you want to share the stats publicly but you shared how your sales have grown and how a lot of stuff ha has really grown thing and, and with social media really being a, a big driving factor of everything. Well, I think the thing you have to look at in terms of like social as a direct sales channel, it, it what, what really has. Um, has happened is it put our dealership on the map. So, in terms of social as a direct sales channel, I'd say, yeah, maybe we have sold a couple. I'd say maybe a handful. Um, but what's really happened is the building of awareness and consideration and putting Lebanon Ford on the map in terms of acquiring partnerships, uh, strategic partnerships with not just Ford at some levels but vendors within the industry who help us test product, get our hands on product um, that uh, would benefit from um, to help some of our other marketing initiatives. So what was interesting, uh, what I tell the story of, we did a drive one for a week uh, campaign. Um, this is sort of kind of what got us well known uh, in the automotive retail space. Was We took a look at what Ford was doing at the national and the global level and we thought, how can we synergize some of those initiatives and how do we localize um, those initiatives as well? So at the time, they had just got off doing the Fiesta movement. And the Fiesta movement was a, um, a campaign that it was helped build awareness of the, the new 2010 Fiesta that was um, all new, it was coming back. Um, it had been in Europe, but it was now coming back to the States. And um, we decided to uh, create our own campaign very similar to that called Drive One for a Week. And that campaign 
um, essentially was trying to find area influencers, influencers um, through uh, channels at the time, again, this is 2010, such as Twillow um, and other various uh, sites because our goal was to find those innovators and early adopters. So if we kind of follow the law of the fusion in some sense, you've got to target those uh, innovators, early adopters to get um, through the bell curve and ultimately you know you get market penetration and for us it was Ford's product has changed the Lebanon Ford brand is starting to change so how do we get that out there in a very cost effective and and, and just overall um, efficient way so we found these influencers we put them in, in lists uh, some of the tactical items and we began following them and then you know put it lightly started building relationships or like a game of double dutch found the opening jumped into the conversation Started to build a real human relationship with these people, um, some good relationships, and we, um, when we felt the relationship was was strong enough, we'd invite them to come onto the lot and test pick any vehicle they wanted to test drive for a week. And uh, we didn't tell them what to do. Uh, we had a couple guidelines, such as a 250 mile rule, couldn't cross state lines, and obviously no drinking and driving. Obvious, some obvious ones. Um, but we just said go, like go experience the product, go have a good time. And these, these individuals would go off and, and, and share about the vehicle, um, share, post pictures, the whole bit. They'd create content. And the interesting part was they'd start to you know, build that conversation not just with ourselves, but with Ford Motor Company and obviously their friends or their network, uh, friends, family, and network. Um, so that was interesting in the fact that we started to merge that product with the Lebanon Ford brand and then Ford and Scott Monty started getting in and kind of helping to promote that and, and kind of fed into those conversations, which was fantastic. Um, and then also from an SEO perspective, um, they would blog or create content on their websites, um, link back to us. So it was also an, an initiative to help in terms of white hat, like good pure SEO efforts of creating content, uh, creating like getting shareable links um, that. We're, we're, we're still live. Go ahead. Uh, sorry about that. Popped up on another screen there. Um, <laughs> create shareable, shareable links um, back to our site. So it was an SEO initiative as well that worked uh, really well. So um, after these people drove their vehicle for a week, they came back. Uh, to the lot, or we picked the vehicle up from them and, and they referred a friend. So we helped build that network across the channels. Now, before I go too long, because I can tend to go long winded, um, the problem we ran into with that initiative was um, sustainability and scalability. We couldn't scale it. The scale and sustainability. Um, so, for instance, I was really the point of contact. For those people. So, if we had 500 drivers between 2010 and today, how would my, how would I be able to maintain that relationship with those people, a quality relationship with those people, um, just using social channels? Obviously, they were here locally. I wouldn't be able to invite all of them to lunch all of the time. The quality of relationship would vary. So then you have a quality problem, and because the average bike cycle is between you know two to three years they weren't necessarily experiencing the everything we had to offer from that retail experience it wasn't like they could just go out and buy something and then keep buying it or you know they didn't necessarily have that product in their hands at all times to reinforce that brand messaging nor as were we as an organization outside of what we were doing socially reinforcing those types of messages and those beliefs um, and those that type of creative across other brand mediums or other medium media. Um, so what we what we had was like this isolated initiative that lasted a week, a week that we couldn't scale, we couldn't sustain because the organization wasn't built for this type of initiative. And it made me realize um, that if we continue doing these things, why we got a lot of traction, why we got a lot of uh, Say exposure. I mean, unbelievable. Um, the the at the end there was an experience gap. So those individuals experiencing those things and thinking innovative would come to the dealership and get a different experience, one that they weren't expecting. And that's when you have a problem, especially 
not just in product, but uh, uh, in, in the retail environment, that becomes an issue. So the focus is really started to turn in-house of how do we build an organization, how do we shape an organization to sustain those types of initiatives. Um, and being a smaller dealership, that one that doesn't necessarily have a lot of budget when it comes to marketing, we need these types of channels to facilitate communication and, and essentially marketing messaging um, to, to help us grow. So. Um, so the initiatives been going on in, throughout the dealership have been how do we how do we shape a message? What is our why? What is our why? What is our purpose? And how do we shape language? How do we shape initiatives or more process procedures to reinforce that why? And then what do we do to fulfill that why? Um, so those are the exercises going through the dealership. And um, anyone who kind of knows this is it starts with people. And if it starts with people, it starts with the hiring process. So you've got to revamp a lot of these, um, the way we've been doing things, the types of people we've been looking for, um, who do we want on the bus, to ensure that when we do these types of campaigns, they're in line with it from a communication standpoint, it's talk the talk, uh, and that experience gap is no longer there. Right, and and you you make a really good point there because a lot of businesses feel that with with social media that uh, sometimes they can just. Uh, uh, hire somebody else to do it and and leave it at that or, or, or whatever but to to really have social media work for you you kinda have to start at you know at the basic level like with the people because if the people themselves in your in your company are not social then how, how do you expect to to get these people on board to really uh, champion your company through Facebook Twitter and and so on well, you know you're absolutely right I mean, it, it, you know it's it's, 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 um, <clears throat> the thing that's different, you know, when it I used to think that social would be much harder at like a Ford Motor Company, right? Or, you know, a larger product. Let's just say like Apple. I'll just throw that out because everyone knows it. But, you know, what they have is their, their messaging and their social is a product. It's a thing. It's, it's, a, and it's, a, it's a single thing. Um, when at our side, it, it it's a service, and it's a local service, and there are people that you're going to inter be interacting with when you show up to the store. So how do you synergize that, and how do you ensure that, that those experience gaps are next to nothing? Um, because you really, for, for a single marketing department, i.e. myself, um, you've got to be able to democratize that out to the people who are building those relationships with the customers to educate those salespeople or those employees on how to do those things. Not only will that help them grow their book of business, but in turn it will help to grow the organization. Yeah, and I should probably go back and say if if you're someone who necessarily can't move your can't necessarily do your social media in house, you could definitely hire someone, and you definitely want someone that's passionate about social media. But if you're wanting your whole uh, your whole team, your all your employees on board, you really have to start with with the hiring process and getting and getting the right people first. Because you know sometimes you can't always always train some some people, and some people they're just not naturally you know social, and they, they don't really uh, fully get the, the power of social networks, if that makes any sense. No, I think I think you're right. And you know, getting back to your, your, your next question, you know, when it comes to, you know, there are those who like, you know, I was telling you the other day, there are those who do social media, and there's organizations that become great, or really great, and use social as a channel, right? And yep. there are certain things that you can outsource. Like, I know you ran that page um, for, I don't know if I can say it, that city. I don't. My, uh, oh Facebook gosh, it's a, I, I, I ran the Facebook page for Area 50, no, it was uh, oh, well, you know, Myrtle Beach. People yeah. don't necessarily like to know others to know who's running their page. Right? But yeah. you, know, you ran the page for Myrtle Beach. Like, that, that make, I mean, no one needs, no one cares really necessarily that you're not, you live in Lebanon. Right? But you're, you're just trying to deliver an experience and there's not necessarily a person associated with Myrtle Beach. It's kind of dangerous to think about, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but in and and you, you hit the point of you know doing that. It it makes sense. You can do those things. But when it comes to like, because 
the, the problem you have in the automotive space right now is dealers are always looking for turnkey solutions, right? I mean, they're looking for the quick fix. They're an interesting bunch because they have money, more money than normal small businesses, right? More local small businesses, but um, they don't want to deal with anything. They're all their sole focus is selling cars, and because of that, they just want a, a, a solution. And in this industry right now, in this industry, social has become a right, not a privilege, and that's causing everything to be outsourced and everything to be done almost the same everywhere else. But if you want to get to the heart of it, and you want to get to what I think really matters is the people and the organization, um, you've got to do start doing things in house. You've got to start setting up, you know, communication decision trees. You've got to start setting up like how do you handle crisis management. You've got to start setting up, uh, you know, just normal communication and uh, communication process and procedures. Um, those types of things. How do you interact? What is common language? What, what's the language you need to use when speaking to a customer? So if you're in doubt, you can fall back on these guidelines to ensure that you're not, you know, making a big bundle. Um, but I think, you know, it just depends on what type of you what, what you want to do. Because there's some places, some companies that can do social and make a hell of a lot of money doing it. Mm -hmm. But in the case of where we are and you know, a dealership particularly, you've got to be a great organization doing remarkable things and telling those stories. Yeah, and so, so since we're on the topic of dealerships, the, the 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 whole stereotype with dealerships are usually those those commercials you'll see like, oh, come on down to Big Bob's Ford and get you know uh, whatever. And, and so there, there's this when it comes to uh, especially car dealerships, a lot of them approach social media as purely a, a marketing platform, a way for them to sell more product, which. Uh, it's an, it's a it's a marketing platform to an extent, but what would you say is the biggest mistake that not just car car dealerships but businesses make with with trying to make money from social media? Um, well, you know, I'm not going to paint with a broad brush because there's definitely companies out there, and I've seen companies that sell through social, and it works. Right? It, it works. Now, the problem is there are or service, you know, service-oriented companies such as ourselves. Um, sometimes product companies that do try to do the same thing, but it doesn't apply. Right? It just it doesn't apply real well. Um, and I think the biggest problem is that companies, usually small businesses, and you know, dealers are very, very bad at this. That they don't understand the difference between marketing and advertising. They don't understand that marketing or advertising is just a subset of marketing, and that there's other things out there other than just pushing a message. Just pushing a message. And um, you know, for us, you know, we our transactions, you know, happen at the store. You know, we don't necessarily sell a lot online. So when we're like clicking through to something to land on something and make that purchase, it doesn't happen. That impulsive business, or that impulsive transaction. But what we try to do is just build awareness and consideration for our brand, and and be and try to be consistent with that over a period of time to stay forefront and to align ourselves with people with similar belief systems. Um, that when they are in that buying cycle or that close that down the funnel, um, they consider us for that transaction. Um, so. When it comes to selling on Facebook, yeah, it can be done. I've seen it, but for us in particular, it just it doesn't it doesn't work. Yeah, and I, I think too, it depends on on how you're you're selling something. Like if you're just saying, you know, buy uh, the you know special discounts, go to this link, whatever, that might not work so well. But but selling an experience. So for example, you guys at Eleven and Ford, you have my tech team, which is really cool, and there's kind of a, an experience behind it. So so kind of tell people a little bit about that and and how that works, because it, it's really different from uh, pretty much every other car dealership that I know of. Yeah. So. The Okay, so before I get into that, I think I want to, what you had said beforehand is you, know, you have to use those channels to differentiate yourself, right, and to be a resource 
and to, I'd say, settle through being a resource, I use the word lightly, but to build consideration through being a resource. So something that's unique to our dealership, um, that's exclusive to our dealership, um, is a service that we call My Tech Team. And uh, My Tech Team believes, or we believe, that everybody should have access and availability to technology. And that we believe that biggest obstacle, the biggest obstacle to having access to technology and availability um, is your own knowledge and comfort. And we run into a lot of times people who are comfortable with what they know but willing to know more and to go further. Uh, they just need a support system behind them, encouragement, and um, just a helping hand. So with that said, this is why we offer um, uh, phone and email support, troubleshooting services, one-on-one -on -one consultations with our representatives, and we'll even show up to your house. Um, we'll make, we make house visits so you can learn in the environment that is most comfortable to you. And our rule of thumb with the house visits are if you can drive to us to purchase a car, we can drive to you um, to, to service your vehicle or service your technological needs. Um, so some of the ways that we really are showing success with Tech Team outside of our own customer base, because um, every customer gets a startup consultation when they purchase a vehicle and then get a follow-up call two weeks later to go over um, anything they might not know, um, app recommendations to get the most out of their vehicle based upon the interest that we, we do during our investigative uh, stage, and uh, software recommendations as well. Um, so one of the things that we did, um, I'm a big proponent of like Marcus Sheridan, uh, the sales lion, when it comes to content marketing. And he did an interview with a good friend of mine, Andy Warner, who is uh, with an agency called Three Birds. Um, and, you know, Marcus uh, made the comment that, um, <clears throat> you know, social is the fire or digital is the fire, but content is the fuel. So, you know, without that content, you're, gonna, you're not going to have a fire. Um, so we sat down and we listed like the top 25 questions we get on a regular basis. And we just broke all of that down, wrote a bunch of articles about it. And really, you know, <laughs> we, um, once we did that, I went to Kroger, which is the grocery store, and uh, I, uh, <laughs> I walked the newsstand and, and found the magazines I liked. And um, one of them that stuck out to me was Cosmopolitan. <laughs> and, oh, my God. Yeah, right. <laughs> Is uh, is um, <laughs> because every time you walk by that magazine, you're like, how many times can they write about sex? Right. How many times can they use sex in a headline and make it work? It's like every month for the past like seven, eight years. I don't know how long. It's been. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. No, excuse me. <laughs> and it was like, okay, so how can we write about technology and syncing phones? Utilizing kind of the cosmopolitan model, you know, five ways to sync your phone. Top five things you didn't know about syncing your phone. Here are ten easy DIY sync Microsoft sync setup and fixes. So we kind of did that type of model of of quick, easy type of content. That um, headline was a big key. Like everything is headline driven, um, but. How can we kind of utilize that model for technology and keep it fresh and keep it uh, keep recycling, not re recycling, but um, taking different angles on things? So um, we publish all those articles on our, our blog, forward-life.com, and we've been able to do a pretty good job optimizing it. So we've um, get traffic from uh, globally, actually, and we've serviced Ford owners um, in 35 of the 50 states. Uh, including the U.S. State Department, Alaska, Hawaii. Um, our representative was up with a gentleman in Hawaii at uh, 11 or 12 o'clock at night our time. And um, I don't know what that is in Hawaii time, Hawaiian time, but I'm sure it's like in the evening um, somewhere, afternoon, evening. But then the guy was like, uh, are you with Ford Motor Company? And we were like, no, we're it's the Ford dealership here in Lebanon, Ohio. 
and we believe that everyone should have access to technology and we're willing to go to great lengths to ensure that everybody is comfortable and knowledgeable about the full product. Um, and then he's like, my god, like, I don't even get the service from my dealership here in Hawaii. And it's like, well, you know, if you ever are in the need for anything, give us a call. And also, we ship vehicles, so when you're in the market, uh, consider us. And um, it's those types of things. Um, well, actually, <laughs> we've even helped a gentleman in the United Arab Emirates so, uh, and in Canada. So we've, we've, we've helped people in Canada. We've actually um, helped other dealerships in, in uh, the country and uh, a Verizon store. Apparently, like, like we're on some type of hotline for people to call in case of a Fort Sync issue. So I, I'm not quite sure, but that seems pretty cool. Um, so doing all those cool things and then you know getting people to talk about that and to share about that um, because it's a unique service, it's a different service in automotive because it's essentially just a mashup of Best Buy Geek Squad, Apple Genius Bar. Um, but 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 better than Geek Squad because Geek Squad sucks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's almost just yeah, uh, you know house visits and that type of stuff. Um, <laughs> But it's really neat, and not only have like our customers taken notice, which has been huge because it's really the tip of the customer service gear, but like Ford Motor Company's taken notice. Um, yeah, you you even uh, uh, oh, probably I, I I don't I don't want to butcher the the time when you, when you did it, but you actually went up to uh, to Ford uh, Motor Company headquarters and talked with Scott Monty, who actually heads up the the whole social media for for Ford. Well, yeah, we did that actually a couple years a couple years ago actually. Yeah. For the tech team, the tech team also kind of helped put us on the map for Ford when it came to like going further, if you want to use their like slogan, um, of doing different things and putting the customer first. Because at the end of the day, we see ourselves as a service company with product offerings, and our job is to build and maintain relationships. Selling and servicing cars is a result of those relationships. And so how do we create services and technologies that are remarkable, that are different, that are unique, that go further, um, and use us as differentiating factors between uh, other dealerships and themselves, which thus helps us become more social and talk about, and it uh, just so well for more. Yeah, and I think you made a really good point about about going about creating content because stuff to do with cars, you know, a lot of that stuff can seem like, how in the hell do I write something about this? But there's tons of inspiration out there, and like you said, Cosmopolitan, even though it gets more and more ridiculous as it goes on, you can get inspiration from, from different things. So, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to, to go about writing about something more often, you know, just, just go and do a search for, for different blogs and kind of get inf inspiration from there. And also, like you said, like how-to and tips articles uh, worked really well for you, and they, they work well in general, like how-to's, tips, and like numbered posts work uh, really well as well. So where do you get your inspiration? Well, I um, get my inspiration from from many things, uh, uh, mostly just mostly just blogs and uh, various uh, just other people in the industry, things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's um, you know, in this day and age, you gotta do especially because if you have to get into content, you gotta see something new. You have to stay fresh. Yeah, I mean, it's just. But that 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 can be a struggle sometimes. Yeah, and and, and it can be uh, it can definitely be be stressful, you know, if you if you're wanting to write more. Like, and, and there's a lot of talk about you need to write X amount of times per week, which honestly it, it's bullshit. I think it, I think it really comes down to to quality. You know, one or two high quality posts are better than five or six completely shitty posts. I don't disagree with you there. I mean, it's like. You, everyone keeps trying to put a, a frequency to things uh, without even knowing, like, what, what, is what you're doing on that frequent basis, like, even matter? Is it even relevant? Does it even impact? So it's like, why do something that many times? It's like with car, it's like car dealers, right? So, for social, right? Really, really, car dealers really just know how to advertise, right? So, what, what social has brought in, which is interesting, is the fact that, um, uh, your experience at a car dealership, Mike, and your branding of a car dealership is really your experience with that salesperson. Because in reality, you're not really hearing about from that dealership other than what you're just seeing on television. 
right? But you, that, that brand has been resonated through your, your relationship with your, with your salesperson. So when you come to the basis of doing social and trying to be more frequent with your customers, and you don't understand necessarily the, the basics of branding and what that can do. So they've met with that, that salesperson once and maybe seen them tw two times a year, two times a year and heard from them maybe three times a year. But if they're hearing these, getting these Facebook messages and these emails and all these other things from you that like you see some of the stuff car dealers post, like just like here are pictures of cats. Here are pictures of dogs. Here are pictures of it's like well, like I get the whole like I'm driving engagement thing, but really it's bullshit. Because like you know what you're doing? Like you are completely branding yourself as something completely away from that core competency. Like I get like like I know there's an opposite side to that, but if you think about it from just a branding perspective, like like if you all you do is post like weird pictures of like <laughs> crazy looking shit and like dogs and cats and like weird like freaky looking shit things like like what are you saying what is that saying to that customer and if you keep doing it because you're being told do it every single day you're branding yourself like something completely different and it blows my mind when I see that type of stuff. Yeah, and and that kind of you kind of though with the whole stuff with Facebook, like like this photo if you think this is cute. With, with businesses like have nothing to do with with cats or, or whatever it is, you know. Part of that though is 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 uh, part of it is kind of Facebook's fault because Facebook has set it up to where. You know, only a, a certain a p small percentage of people will actually see your content. But if you get people to, uh, if you get more people to actually like a post and interact on it, more people will see it. So it's kind of led to a lot of businesses posting this what I call just shit content, uh, asking people for likes and shares. Uh, but then also it kind of comes comes back to the business themselves. You know, just uh, you know, get better. You know, stop posting this this crap that. Ugh, it just it just it just really bugs me when when businesses do that because it's it's totally you know like you're saying it, it it has nothing to do with the business itself and so I think I, I think I think businesses kind of need to work more on on storytelling you know f tell better stories and, and talk about things that people want to connect with without having to ask all the time it makes you look needy when you you constantly ask for likes and shares and stuff like that the problem, the problem is is and, you know I'm a white person I'm a corporate black person. Like I, I think up at the hundred thousand foot level. Like I just do. I dance amongst the clouds. Like I am, like just one of those guys who comes up with an idea. I'm in a a good idea fair, you could say it. And you know, the issue when it comes to like, and I'm right now like my, what I'm trying to do is shape that story. How do you shape a story and then a message around that story? And you know, there are stories within the stories, and you can go into all that kind of stuff, but. The difficult part, and you know, a good friend of mine is, is working with me to try to think this way, is how do you operationalize that type of stuff? And with a dealership, it's so difficult to, how do you operationalize telling an overarching story? And um, and that's difficult. I mean, that's difficult. And like like I said, there, there can be stories within the stories of like sharing a story of, you know, we uh, just we sponsored a huge event last night with the University of Cincinnati who helped fight breast cancer. And there was a woman amongst us uh, who is a wife of one of our technicians, fought breast cancer and uh, overcame it, survivor, and she's just now received. Um, she just now got. Uh, I don't say diagnosed, but we say relapse, not relapse, but remission, right? But yeah. She now has like she has a tumor in her brain, and mm. uh, she's been at all these events because we've done a couple in the past. She was in a wheelchair, and she was just weak, but. You know, that is a story. But you can share that story, and um, but there's got to be a purpose behind that type of story. Um, so, like, telling a story is great, and I think it's become like the new buzzword, really. The engagement was well and no storytelling, but it, the hard part is how do you operationalize telling a story throughout an organization that you can sustain it and keep it consistent. So I don't know. I mean, what have you seen from that, that standpoint? 
Yeah, I, I think I, I think uh, I think you're probably right about it being a buzzword. But just about there's all sorts of different words that are uh, buzzwords with social media. It seems like a new one comes out every once in a while. Like like for a while, engage was the big buzzword and whatever. But uh, I, I think you know storytelling is very important, and, and it really starts with you know actually uh, I think kind of goes back to 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 knowing your why. And, and your message and, and, and really getting that out there and also you know focusing on, on contributing really high quality content and you know getting people to interact around that content and, and, and being and really being a resource and not just not just some page that people happen to see every once in a while sharing cat photos and asking for likes. Yeah, it's a, um, and you know you, honestly you know why that kind of recording is done and that's done I don't know how industry, other industries are but the reason why that's done in the automotive industry, so like yeah, it's, it's ridiculous, is one because it's easy for the vendor to turnkey that type of stuff. Like, oh yeah. And then two, it takes advantage of that edge rank, right? So yeah. the thing is, they'll post those like three pictures of cats, dogs, and children, right? And then get that build up that edge rank before it decays, right? And then post a sales message. Yeah, so it's it's a reach pool, but again, it's how can I get as much reach? Which again, this is like what really matters in Facebook now is honestly, because you know, if they're saying like promote this post for X amount of bucks to get this amount of reach, then it's a reach game anyway. But it's a, a tedious reach game when you get into do you sacrifice your brand image and your, your um, what people feel when they see your brand for getting that sales message out or do you create that type of content that sparks engagement centered around your core competency and then um, shoot that message out that you're hoping for a transaction. Yeah and speaking of edge rank this kind of gets us into something that I really wanted us to talk about because it's it's uh, you know uh, something that's that, that's really gearing up on Facebook is promoted posts on pages and just yesterday actually uh, promoted posts on profile profiles are going to be rolling out through the US so basically with promoted posts on profiles like if you have a combined uh, if you have less than 5,000 combined of uh, uh, friends and subscribers you can pay seven dollars and so more than 12 to 16 percent of your actual friends and subscribers will see your post and and, and it's kind of like a promoted posts are kind of the, the, really the new ads you know, as we're sidebar, and now we're going to be seeing more and more ads in the news feed where nobody fucking wants them at all. And, and so, of course, there's big benefits to to business, huge benefits to businesses here. But is it going to is it going to uh, be good for users? You know that. Uh, uh. Like this is where uh, I mean, we could go. I mean, I mean like, like, <laughs> we we've got plenty I'll, of time. I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. You know, that Forbes article, right, that Forbes article about 80% of my Facebook advertising clicks are, are fake, right? Right? So, like, that sort of rings true with the results that I've gotten on my business page. So, um, I like the sponsored stories a lot more than the, uh, what was it, the reach generator? Is that what they, the other side mm -hmm. of it? Okay. The sponsored story things make sense. Now, it's how you utilize that as well. Exactly. And because if you use it as an interruption, like the same way you would interrupt a television show with commercials, like you're going to fall flat on your ass. And it's going to, I've seen it with this dealership. I hate coming back to the dealership, but I've seen it with this dealership. And by God, I've seen this thing in my news feed about, because I follow the dealers. <laughs> and they've done this so many times, they have gotten blown up. Like it was a good thing, and now they've gotten blown up. Um, so, you know. Again, when you hand a hammer to a two-year-old, what do you expect? Right? They're going to play around with it for a while. They might do something with it, but in the end, they're probably going to hurt themselves. Now, with personal profiles, this <laughs> blows up. Check, like, check out a new I just had a baby. Yeah. Check it out. It's like we've gotten to the point as a society where we are now like, paying for social status. And now you can, like, we've always been paying for social status when we buy, like, fashion and stuff, but this is, like, a direct transaction that, like, I am paying to be heard more. Like, what the yeah. hell? Like, I equate that, and I was, like, huge. I did this, like, and I'm, don't for a minute. Like, I played WoW, 
and I played like the Final Fantasy MMO, and I stopped more and more Final Fantasy when I started using my own money to pay for <laughs> game currency. Yeah. And that's what it feels like in this sense. Like you are using actual like U.S. dollars, right? Real life currency to pay for a social status, and I can see it's becoming like a huge addiction. Like, <laughs> like I, I don't know. But the thing is, is like, like, you know, will this be a bigger problem for you and I and people who are in the community than it would be if you're surrounded with a network that isn't part of a networking community? You know what I'm saying? Like, is it that going to be the difference where we want to promote our stuff? Um, where the average Joe and their average network of however many would the averages these days, like one hundred other friends, um, are they going to do that same thing? But I don't know, man. That's just like, <laughs> like I, I hate to say, like you know, they're a business and they've got to make money. I get mm, that. Yeah. But jeez, <laughs> I don't know. Like I thought that was going to be one area they did not like cross the one line they didn't cross, and it's just like you hear it and you're like, wow. Like, you really cannot make money off this thing other than just advertising dollars. Like, just plain old, like, just reach and frequency. It just gets back to reach and frequency. Yeah, and as far as promoted posts for pages, I, I of course there's, there's, there's you know, a lot of businesses that get it and understand that, you know, if they just put up a post advertising something and then paying for it, and that, that's really going to upset people. Uh, but there's, I, I think also the perception of social media is still not really there yet where a lot of businesses understand that this isn't just it's purely some marketing platform where you can let everyone know about the, all the time about the, your, these sales and deals you have going on and so that's kind of the problem with promoted posts you know I see some good promoted posts here and there but then also there be like just discounts and stuff and and people the perception of, of, of that is that stuff's supposed to be in my sidebar that stuff's not supposed to be in my newsfeed so it, it's kind of a, a catch-22 with with the whole thing and as far as like uh, promoted posts on Profiles. It, it it goes back to your th same thing. Where we're what, what you're saying is it's all, now it's going to be buying social status and and do people r really care that you are getting married? Do people necessarily care that you uh ha you you just got this new job and 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 do people want to be constantly you know consistently inundated with that stuff? Yeah, and you know the. The problem that I see from this, man, like the problem is because, like, you know, I am not getting a whole lot out of Facebook on a personal level anymore. Since they turned to timeline, like, I don't. Like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're you're more of a you're more of a friendster, friendster guy. Well, like, I really <laughs> know that, like, whether it be a, like, honestly, really not friendster, but like, it, it it's it's turned more into like me, 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 which like I get, like, and sometimes I like do it too. Oh, everyone loves to talk about themselves. Like, I don't feel like people post things for other people anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like, it used to be yeah. like, Facebook, and I don't mean to get all, like, by all at least, yay, but, like, post things for others. Now, you could say, like, them seeing my baby, like, they get value in. But, like, it's just become so about yourself. Now, you have the ability to promote yourself all the time, and it's just like, God, leave, man. Like, come on. And, like, the fact that you know in schools is a bunch of marketing folks and people trying to like not game the system but play the system. So they overuse pictures, they overuse like just stupid crap to get that you know, take advantage of the edge rank and now they're gonna be promoting that stuff. It's like, well, I'm gonna unfollow you and or unlike you or you know what I mean it's like, well, you, that's your prerogative and it's like, well why did you force me to do that? Like, you know what I mean? Like why should you be forcing people to do that? I, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, it ca kind of brings us back to an important point. You know, everyone wants to talk about themselves, but uh, most people, honestly, and it's hard for a lot of people to to to. Get, but a lot of people, honestly, even though they're following you, they don't necessarily give a shit about certain things to do with yourself. And so, if you if you're constantly, and the point here is, if you're constantly talking about yourself, talking about your business, talking about whatever it is, uh, people are naturally going to tune you out over time, and and they're just going to not, you know, see your posts anymore because they're not going to be interacting with your stuff. Yeah, and I think that's what I've done to my point. It's just like, 
just like that. Like, this is just, just, it's just tiring. Like, from a business <laughs> perspective, like, it's great. Like, love it. If I can promote shit to money, like, fantastic. Yeah. But from a personal standpoint, it's just like, my God. It's, I, I don't, I, I don't know. Like, it, like, you know, I'll be first to admit, like, when I don't know something, like, I'll be, I don't know. But when you get to this point of monetizing these types of channels like this for the average Joe, like, it just loses its feel. Like, I, because I was on Facebook in 2005. Like, I was, well, I was one of the early people to do it in college. And, you know, it was completely different it's, than it is now. And it's really, it's, it's gotten so just monetarily driven by things. And, you know, how can you justify to the user experience, like, a, you know, to pay for your post to be, you know, escalated and, and slow the decay through edge rank is a good thing for everybody. I don't know, because not everybody knows how to make relevant messages. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's definitely going to be something that we're going to have to watch for for the time being because you know Facebook's really transitioned from this free platform to a lot of their services like uh, you know just recently offers went from free to being paid as well. So it's uh, you know and and of course Facebook's got to make money. They're 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 a business. Yes, they're a free social network, but they're also a business. But kind of where do you draw the line with with where you're integrating all these different services that are essentially advertising? And and do you do you inundate people? People with all these promoted posts in their news feeds, and so it's kind of a kind of a thing to yeah. Watch. And it's like when you start giving things for free, and then you start making people pay for them, is when you start, like it, it, it. You get for a user, or it's like, well, does this really matter to me? Like, do I really want to be spending this type of money? Now, granted, like it's still free to use Facebook, but you, you know how much are they going to try to like monetize from from a from a you pay to use this, you pay to use that, you pay to use this. Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm I'm not sure. Um, but oh, what was that? What was I going to say about that? I, mean, I had a complete brain fart. Um, I'm, uh, it was probably something really brilliant, and now you're well, gonna I mean, you're gonna forget it forever. So we're gonna just move on, and so I'm not sitting here like thinking like. like uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm kind of want to transition away from this because we are getting kind of close to to an hour on here. But I want to talk to you like a little bit more about like SEO. So you know, with, with Google and Google Plus, we've really seen you know the transition from you know just regular organic content being ranked in the search engine, and with Search Plus your world now, there's Google Plus results in there. So you know, kind of uh, from a, from an SEO standpoint, where do you see like Google Plus and and the overall picture and and the importance of it? Mm. Uh, well, from a local business standpoint, it's huge um, because it's merged with places pages. So. That's actually a big one. Um, now the problem um, f from a from a SEO like content perspective is like you know they're definitely looking at it from a social signal po point of view like absolutely and getting that content posted on there and, and done the right way is important. But like for us like we don't we don't necessarily get enough of those social signals in terms of the quantity of of um, like plus ones, if we're talking specifically about Google Plus, to warrant any different change in the search result. Now, the, the, the difference can be you get those customers to plus one stuff, to, uh, and you know, from our analytics, like I would say, I think it's like 15% of traffic to our site is signed into Google. So, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a bit, it's like a Pretty big number signed into Google, so you know their results are or have been skewed or being skewed through what their history is and yeah. their network is. So you know, taking advantage of that from the sense of we do a lot of repeat and referral business, and um, that type of stuff helps when if we can get that content out to the sales team, they say that sell that share that stuff socially. Those people, you know, plus one more type of stuff, um, and then you kind of. For someone, they see that you like this, and it kind of all feeds obviously together. But for us, it's 
Uh, it's going to be bigger. I absolutely think it's going to be bigger. But when it comes to SEO in Google Plus specifically, um, like I'm aware of it, I'm looking into it, but I've kind of put it into that spectator column for us because we, we don't do, we're not, we don't have the reach, we don't have that visibility to really have that impact a lot of the stuff that we do. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of it too, you know, comes back to uh, is your audience on Google Plus? Like you, you for example, a while back you told me how you figured out if, if Lebanon Ford's customer base was actually used Google, Google Plus and and everything. And and while while Google Plus is great, you know, over 400 million users, 100 million months, whatever it is now, you know, it's it's great and all. But just because there's all these people here doesn't necessarily mean your audience is going to be here. And I think that's a big, a big thing to take away because there's a lot of people who, who I guess, I, I mean, I guess you could call them Google Plus fanboys that you know talk about Google Plus and and how amazing it is, and especially uh, social media consultants and and whoever. But they forget to realize that not everyone's audience is here, and just because it's it's great for other people doesn't mean it'll necessarily be great for you. And also from an, from an SEO standpoint. No, you're absolutely right. And and uh, we, the way we did it was uh, pretty interesting <laughs> to, to mini rigged it. Um, but the interesting thing is, like, when it, like the problem I have with the cool Google Plus thing is the fact that like, we got, uh, we started getting, we had a review process down. We were getting good Google reviews. Then Google Plus got implemented, and then we gotten zero reviews since it got instituted. Yeah, and because people have to have a Google Plus profile, but the majority of people don't care, because at the end of the day, social network is about the people, and if your friends and family members aren't on that platform, why the hell would you sign up? Hey, it's yeah, to an old, normal average Joe. So that's the problem I have with that, and they've got a real issue with that. Um, but you know, getting back to the whole SEO thing, I think if you have the reach and you you're creating good content, you've got that reach, and you're maybe a bigger brand. Or even like you do something good as a small business and get that spike, yeah, that can be absolutely huge, absolutely. But it's going to take those things to really sway the giant. Yeah, and and also when it comes to, I I see a lot of people that using Google Plus more, especially businesses, but they're using it specifically because it can be good for SEO. They're not using it to actually build relationships with people. They're just using it to bam their shit out there. And I think the totally wrong approach. Which is it and whatnot, but just using Google Plus purely for SEO and and that, that that's completely completely defeating the point of uh, of social media in general. You don't want to just throw your stuff out there. You don't want to just talk about yourself. You want to actually you know uh, build connections with people and build these relationships because relationships are really what will translate to sales, not not constantly spamming your stuff. Yeah, but you see, this is like the other side of the coin. Like, there's like. No, I agree with you on that point. But like, when it comes to like the business aspect of it, like you want to try to get that brand out there as much as possible and be in front of as many people as possible. And it just again becomes like a really frequency. And yeah, like I think because the business side of things, this is kind of where, especially in my industry, I hate to keep using it, but like we've been told, build relationships, build relationships. Relationships, good relationships, engage, 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 and it hasn't translated to anything. It hasn't done anything. And now it's like, okay, well, this hippie new age, which I hate to put it in the category, but that's the way it's being viewed. It's not really working, so we're going to get back to business as usual. But I, there's a fine line there. I mean, I agree with you. You've got to build those relationships. And you've got to, you have to engage. Just appreciate the plans. But you know, you, there's got to be trying to gain that system. A little bit and trying to uh, expand that system. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, just get your stuff found. Yeah, and and you make a good point about just telling people to build relationships and engage. It's 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 not that simple, you know. I I think a lot of it has to do with how well you can communicate yourself. There's a lot of people that completely suck at communication. They they don't know how to talk to people and and you know to to actually be able to properly and effectively communicate with people. You know, it's the same on social networks as it is in real life. And some people aren't good at communicating in real life. So why would they be able to communicate well in in social networks? It's kind of it kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's going to be it's a it's healthy mix, but you know businesses are starting to they've it's been such on the far stream of like let's hold hands and engage. 
and now it's starting to swing backwards to like business as usual type of things. And the, and the people who are getting it right are people who are are doing the right things, are underst understand their why, creating content shaped around that why um, that makes sense, and they're getting the quantity and they're, they're maintaining the quality. So all the right things are happening, and um, you know, and that's how you'll be truly great. But yeah, you can gain anything, and maybe that's what you're starting to see. Yeah, and uh, I, I definitely <laughs> It's like when agree. marketers show up to the party, it ruins everything. It's like, <laughs> no like, like, when marketers show up, like, okay, how do we monetize this? How do we get people into this? Like, it ruins the whole flow of the game. And it's like no joke. It really is no joke. And I mean, you saw it with MySpace, uh, everything. But... Uh, when it comes, but like marketers come in, they're slow to the table. They get in, they do their thing, and then they squelch it, they squash it, and then people go on to another route to find something new, and then marketers come behind them, and it's just like this like thing of uh, it's just it's like insanity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, it, it's it's funny you mention that because I mean it, it it is the truth, and and a lot of people don't realize that you don't you know to do well with social media you don't have to you know to to, to do well with social media uh, as far as like you know building an audience and stuff it, is a lot of people are using these traditional principles with with building an audience on, on, online with social media and they they don't understand that it, this is a different this is a different avenue this is a different platform and you've got to apply different things to it. And and you don't you and the thing is you don't have to constantly you know post about specials and deals you don't have to constantly you know spam people about the stuff you can build an audience but it just takes time and you've got to you know learn these different approaches to doing it and and not go by the you know, not just uh, kind of have the the uh, advertising mentality of but you always have to advertise because that's just not going to work. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you in that sense. Um... So, what do you think in terms of like, uh, in terms of like, when you tell a business or you're consulting for a company, you know, I, I found this funny comic the other day, and it was like, um, <laughs> if they, if they haven't liked us, they haven't plus one us, they haven't followed us, but I, I bet they'll pin us. And yeah. It, it, it was uh, it's like you get the same thing here. It's like. Okay, now you gotta be on this one. 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 And there's so much breadth, but there's no depth to any of this stuff. And uh, I chuckle at that type of stuff. And so, how do you kind of uh, determine whether or not a company should be on this channel or that channel? How do you well, prioritize that? Well, I mean, it, it's it all comes back to your audience. It's it's your audience. If your audience is not there, why are you spending all this time there? And and, and sometimes those sometimes though there are there are, are social networks that come along like Pinterest where there uh, isn't necessarily uh, when it first started there wasn't necessarily an audience, but there was a lot of businesses that hopped on there and now are doing really well. But uh, it, it comes back to your audience. It, it, you need to figure out if your audience is there, and 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 you know, being able to to actually find them and you know communicate with them. Because if they're if they're not there, it, it's really wasting your time. It's kind of like putting an ad. Say you say you sell I don't know cupcakes or or whatever. Putting an ad in like a a porn magazine. You know, it it, it it's kind of the wrong place. You know, you you you've got to put yourself in front of the right people, and if the right people aren't there, then you need to be investing time elsewhere where where those people are. So, message to cupcake uh, bakeries. Thank yes, you. yes, cupcake owners and and I mean cupcake sellers and cake sellers, do not post ads in Playboy, Hustler, or any of those. Just uh, just adds up. That's I could really use a cupcake now that I'm doing my thing. <laughs> Well, cool. I I think uh, I think we'll. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was just making a comment off the top. No, it's just uh, you know when it comes to like priority of, of channel, I think it's, it's quite interesting that sometimes it's just dictated by, by not the business objectives or what the company is doing. It's like what that person can either deliver or it's just another flavor of the week. Say so I can set you up on this thing and do it a little bit for you. But when it comes to like knowing how to use it from a strategic standpoint, or like, and bring it down to the tactical level, 
uh, like I'm not going to worry about that. Which is why I think you get a lot of that smoke in the air. Of, oh, now you got to be on this one. But I just learned this one. Yeah, but you got to be on this one too, man. Like, come on, like you don't you want to be hip, right? You want to be cool. It's like, yeah, like I'll be on there. It's like, it's like it's like my God, like you got it's we, we even had like Ford one time, like back in the day. Like we came in and you're like, we're here to set up your Facebook, Twitter, and Google profile. And I was like, well, we already have those, but like, are you going to train me? <gasps> and they said, no, we're just here to set you up on them. Right, and and all you have to do is you just have to post post your stuff there, and then people will like it, and people will subscribe to your vlog or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> it's that simple. Day, you're just causing the business to become disenchanted with the whole platform, and then you have a real issue. Yeah, it, I, I think it kind of goes full circle back to you know you have to have the the right people in place, and you have to you have to train them. You can't just throw them on social networks and and with with just a little bit of knowledge and expect them to do really well with it. Because there's a lot of a lot of moving pieces, and you know it can take just one one little mistake. And that can completely just get you all sorts of bad publicity, lose customers, and who knows what else. Yeah, it's, um, it's you know, with, with the automotive vendors in this space, I mean, they, they try to keep their head spinning on what channel to be on. Like, oh, you got to be on all these channels, and there's like a, a channel of the month, literally. <laughs> uh, it's just like, guys, like, do you even know how to do anything on these channels, or are you just telling me to be on these channels? To keep my head spinning, and then, like, at some point, I'm not going to have enough bandwidth to sustain anything on these channels, and it's the peeve, the pet peeve. Well, cool. Yeah, uh, I, I was really glad we were able to. I was able to have you on this week, and and so uh, let everyone know uh, before we go uh, where they can find you and check you out and check out Lebanon Ford and all that good stuff. So you can find me online on Facebook and Twitter. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, not it's we've talked about this before. It's not Crater J. It's Crater Ja. Yeah, yeah. It's like I don't know what I was thinking. Of. <laughs> so you can find me in those areas, and you can find uh, our dealership blog at Ford-Life.com and our new website at Well, awesome! It was great having you on, Jeff. Yeah, appreciate it, Mike. Thanks.